In the coming days, America will hear two very distinct and dramatically different viewpoints on these questions. One viewpoint is that of President Clinton and the Clinton administration. Candidate Clinton pledged to balance the budget within five years, and President Clinton, in his inaugural address, spoke of cutting our massive debt. And he also spoke about sacrifice. In fact, within hours of the president's inauguration, I said I was pleased to hear the president use the word sacrifice, a word that strikes fear in the hearts of many in this chamber. But President Clinton is absolutely right. If we are to put our economic house in order, if we are going to do right by our children and grandchildren, then we must deal with our national debt. Now that is what I said shortly after his inauguration. Now that was January 20, 1993. But unfortunately, the president's actions have not matched his words of that day. The president is making no attempt to balance the budget. As we know, his proposed budget would give us $200 billion deficits and more, as I said earlier, for as far as the eye could see. The president is making no effort to cut our debt. As we know, under his own proposed budget, another trillion dollars will have been added to our nation's debt by 1997. Not a balanced budget, but another trillion dollars in debt. The president is making no effort to preserve and protect Medicare for our children and grandchildren. He washed his hands of the report of the Medicare Board of Trustees, which included three members of his cabinet. This was not Senator Dominici's or Senator Kyle's or Senator Grassley's report. This was the Board of Trustees and the President's own cabinet members' report. Medicare will be broke within seven years, they said. If that happens, you cannot pay anybody's doctor or hospital bills. I believe we ought to fix it. Senator Dominici will recall that in 1983, we had the same problem with Social Security. That was 12 years ago. Then Ronald Reagan, the Republican president, Speaker O'Neill, a Democrat, and Howard Baker, the majority leader in the Senate, put together a commission. Let's try that one again. <clears throat> In the coming days, America will hear two very distinct and dramatically different viewpoints on these questions. The one viewpoint is that of President Clinton and the Clinton administration. Candidate Clinton pledged to balance the budget within five years, and President Clinton, in his inaugural address, spoke of cutting our massive debt. And he also spoke about sacrifice. In fact, within hours of the President's inauguration, I said, I was pleased to hear the President use the word sacrifice a word that strikes fear in the hearts of many in this chamber. But President Clinton is absolutely right. If we are to put our economic house in order, if we are going to do right by our children and grandchildren, then we must deal with our national debt. That is what I said shortly after his inauguration. That was January 20, 1993. But unfortunately, the President's actions have not matched his words of that day. The president is making no attempt to balance the budget. As we know, his proposed budget would give us $200 billion deficits and more, as I said earlier, for as far as the eye could see. The president is making no effort to cut our debt. As we know, under his own proposed budget, another trillion dollars will have been added to our nation's debt. By 1997, not a balanced budget, but another trillion dollars in debt. Now, the president is making no effort to preserve and protect Medicare for our children and grandchildren. He washed his hands of the report of the Medicare Board of Trustees, which included three members of his cabinet. This was not Senator Dominici's or Senator Kyle or Senator Grassley's report. This was the Board of Trustees and the president's own cabinet members' report. Medicare will be broke within seven years, they said. If that happens, you cannot pay anybody's doctor or hospital bills. I believe we ought to fix it. Senator Dominici will recall that in 1983, we had the same problem with Social Security. 
But that was 12 years ago. Then Ronald Reagan, the Republican president, Speaker O'Neill, a Democrat, and Howard Baker, the majority leader in the Senate, put together a commission. One more time on this one. In the coming days, America will hear two very distinct and dramatically different viewpoints on these questions. One viewpoint is that of President Clinton and the Clinton administration. Candidate Clinton pledged to balance the budget within five years, and President Clinton, in his inaugural address, spoke of cutting our massive debt. And he also spoke about sacrifice. In fact, within years of the President's inauguration, I said, I was pleased to hear the President use the word sacrifice, a word that strikes fear in the hearts of many in this chamber. But President Clinton is absolutely right. If we are to put our economic house in order, if we are going to do right by our children and grandchildren, then we must deal with our national debt. Now that is what I said shortly after his inauguration, and that was January 20, 1993. But unfortunately, the President's actions have not matched his words of that day. The President is making no attempt to balance the budget. As we know, his proposed budget would give us $200 billion deficits and more, as I said earlier, for as far as the eye could see. So the President is making no effort to cut our debt. As we know, under his own proposed budget, another trillion dollars will have been added to our nation's debt by 1997. Not a balanced budget, but another trillion dollars in debt. The President is making no effort to preserve and protect Medicare for our children and grandchildren. He washed his hands of the report of the Medicare Board of Trustees, which included three members of his cabinet. This was not Senator Dominici's or Senator Kyle's or Senator Grassley's report. This was the Board of Trustees and President's own cabinet members' report. Medicare will be broke within seven years, they said. If that happens, you cannot pay anybody's doctor or hospital bills. I believe we ought to fix it. Senator Dominici will recall that in 1983, we had the same problem with Social Security. But that was 12 years ago. Then Ronald Reagan, the Republican president, Speaker O'Neill, a Democrat, and Howard Baker, the majority leader in the Senate, put together a commission. For 15 years, I have been haunted by a nightmare. It is the same dream every time. I am asleep at home. The sound of someone entering the house awakens me. I call out, who is it? When there is no reply, I ask again, who's there? I hear steps coming up the staircase. I cry out, help, help. At first, the sound escapes my throat as a whisper, but as the steps approach my bedroom door and the knob begins to turn, my cries fill the house. My wife wakes me. I've been shouting out in my sleep, not just in my dream. Sometimes I'm actually shaking in terror, so hard that falling asleep again is difficult. I'm afraid that the dream will begin where it left off. This is the only dream that I ever remember. It recurs at least twice a year and nothing about it changes. It's the same sequence, the same scenario every time. I do not understand its hold on me but I know its origin. It began with a violent act. As a young man in Washington, D.C. in the 1960s, I was befriended by one of the most gentle, civilized, and learned of men, Charles Frankel, philosopher, professor, assistant secretary of state. He left government and returned to his suburban New York home to teach at Columbia University and direct the new National Humanities Center. One morning in 1979, he and his wife Helen were found in their home brutally murdered. When I learned the news, I was shaken. I couldn't believe that someone I knew personally, someone so much the embodiment of a genuinely human and civilized existence, could be so violently terrorized and brutalized by unknown assailants. Of all the people I knew, Charles and Helen Frankel seemed the most likely to die peacefully in their sleep of natural causes. I've not talked about or discussed this publicly, 
None of us likes to admit that we have nightmares when we're no longer children. But the double murder etched itself deeply in my psyche, playing itself out again and again in the nightmare. One more reminder of the presence of violence in America. My haunting dream has left me even more sympathetic to people whose fear of violence springs not from someone else's experience, but from the reality of their own lives. For many people who live in neighborhoods where crime is rampant and guns are pervasive, fear is a constant specter. Two-thirds of inner-city children in one Alabama survey reported being victims of at least one violent act, and 43% said they had witnessed a murder. One told of her weariness at going home and spending the entire evening on the floor to protect herself against stray bullets. I think, too, of James Darby, the nine-year-old in New Orleans, who last year wrote President Clinton imploring him to stop the killing. James wrote, I think that somebody might kill me. I'm asking you nicely to stop it. I know you can do it. Nine days later, walking home from a Mother's Day picnic with his mother, James Darby was shot in the head and killed. The victim of a shotgun fired into a crowd, allegedly by a disgruntled young man. Reality for James Darby was far more terrible than any dream. Those of us who can afford safe homes and secure neighborhoods can hardly imagine it, but we must try. Consider these facts. In the U.S., nearly a million teenagers are victims of violent crimes each year. Killers are killed alike, are younger than ever, and more people are dying because guns are being used more often. The number of teenagers and young children killed annually by firearms rose from 3,373 in 1986 to 5,356 in 1991, an increase of 59% compared to a 10% increase in the number of adults killed. For 15 years, I have been haunted by a nightmare. It is the same dream every time. I am asleep at home. The sound of someone entering the house awakens me. I call out, who is it? When there is no reply, I ask again, who's there? I hear steps coming up the staircase. I cry out, help, help. At first, the sound escapes my throat as a whisper. But as the steps approach my bedroom door and the knob begins to turn, my cries fill the house. My wife wakes me. I've been shouting out in my sleep, not just in my dream. Sometimes I'm actually shaking in terror, so hard that falling asleep again is difficult. I'm afraid that the dream will begin where it left off. This is the only dream that I ever remember. It recurs at least twice a year, and nothing about it changes. It's the same sequence, the same scenario, every time. I do not understand its hold on me, but I know its origin. It began with a violent act. As a young man in Washington, D.C., in the 1960s, I was befriended by one of the most gentle, civilized, and learned of men, Charles Frankel, philosopher, professor, assistant secretary of state. He left government and returned to his suburban New York home to teach at Columbia University and direct the new National Humanities Center. One morning in 1979, he and his wife, Helen, were found in their home brutally murdered. When I learned the news, I was shaken. I couldn't believe that someone I knew personally, someone so much the embodiment of a genuinely human and civilized existence, could be so violently terrorized and brutalized by unknown assailants. Of all the people I knew, Charles and Helen Frankel seemed the most likely to die peacefully in their sleep of natural causes. I have not talked about or discussed this publicly. None of us likes to admit that we still have nightmares when we're no longer children. But the double murder etched itself deeply in my psyche, playing itself out again and again in the nightmare. A one more reminder of the presence of violence in America. My haunting dream has left me even more sympathetic to people 
whose fear of violence springs not from someone else's experience, but from the reality of their own lives. For many people who live in neighborhoods where crime is rampant and guns are pervasive, fear is a constant specter. Two-thirds of inner-city children in one Alabama survey reported being victims of at least one violent act, and 43% said they had witnessed a murder. One told of her weariness at going home and spending the entire evening on the floor to protect herself against stray bullets. I think, too, of James Darby, a nine-year-old in New Orleans who last April wrote President Clinton imploring him to stop the killing. James wrote, I think that somebody might kill me. I'm asking you nicely to stop it. I know you can do it. Nine days later, walking home from a Mother's Day picnic with his mother, James Darby was shot in the head and killed. The victim of a shotgun fired into a crowd allegedly by a disgruntled young man. Reality for James Darby was far more terrible than any dream. Those of us who can afford safe homes and secure neighborhoods can hardly imagine it, but we must try. Consider these facts. In the U.S., nearly a million teenagers are victims of violent crimes each year. Killers are killed alike, are younger than ever, and more people are dying because guns are being used more often. The number of teenagers and young children killed annually by firearms rose from 3,373 in 1986 to 5,356 in 1991, an increase of 59% compared to a 10% increase in the number of adults killed. Mr. President, as senators are aware, the Senate is preparing to go to conference with the House to iron out the vast differences between their respective versions of the rail deregulation bill. We finished our work on that issue last April and have not had to greatly concern ourselves with the provisions of that legislation during the months it has taken the House to debate and conclude its deliberations. What is disturbing is that the House debate has brought to light many problems which could well have changed positions taken by a number of my Senate colleagues, particularly with regard to joint rate surcharge and cancellation provisions. I doubt that many of us had any profound understanding of the consequences of this provision when it was brought in as a last minute floor amendment. In fact, the legislative expansion provided along with the amendment that day proved to be in many ways inaccurate and misleading. It was misleading in what it did explain and eloquent in what it failed to mention at all. The surcharge and cancellation provisions we accepted and the modified version passed by the House will create chaos in American rail transportation. Incredible increases in shipping costs are inevitable. At best, parts of America can expect half the service at twice the cost. In all too many communities, shippers can look forward to no rail service at all the existing network of joint routes and rates was designed to allow freight traffic to move from origin to destination across the lines of several connecting carriers under a single rate, a long haul rate cheaper than the sum of local rates to be transversed. In some cases, this simply eliminates the problem of you can't get there from here without separate quotes from two or more railroads. In others, it provides competition 
to the big railroads whose single line route to the same destination might otherwise dominate the market and force a chain of small railroads out of business. Let's try that one again. <clears throat> Mr. President, as Senators are aware, the Senate is preparing to go to conference with the House to iron out the vast differences between their respective versions of the rail deregulation bill. We finished our work on that issue last April and have not had to greatly concern ourselves with provisions of that legislation during the months it has taken the House to debate and conclude its deliberations. What is disturbing is that the House debate has brought to light many problems which could well have changed positions taken by a number of my Senate colleagues, particularly with regard to joint rate surcharge and cancellation provisions. I doubt that many of us had any profound understanding of the consequences of this provision when it was brought in as a last-minute floor amendment. In fact, the legislative explanation provided along with the amendment that day proved to be in many ways inaccurate and misleading. It was misleading in what it did explain and eloquent in what it failed to mention at all. The surcharge and cancellation provisions we accepted and the modified version passed by the House will create chaos in America, rail transportation. Incredible increases in shipping costs are inevitable at best parts of America can expect half the service at twice the cost. In all too many communities, shippers can look forward to no rail service at all. The existing network of joint routes and rates was designed to allow freight traffic to move from origin to destination across the lines of several connecting carriers under a single rate. A long haul rate cheaper than the sum of local rates to be transversed. In some cases, this simply eliminates the problem of you can't get there from here without separate quotes from two or more railroads. In others, it provides competition to the big railroads whose single line route to the same destination might otherwise dominate the market and force a chain of small railroads out of business. One more time on this one. Mr. President, as Senators are aware, the Senate is preparing to go to conference with the House to iron out the vast differences between their respective versions of the rail deregulation bill we finished our work on that issue last April and have not had to greatly concern ourselves with provisions of that legislation during the months it has taken the House to debate and conclude its deliberations. What is disturbing is that the House debate has brought to light many problems which could well have changed positions taken by a number of my Senate colleagues, particularly with regard to joint rate surcharge and cancellation provisions. I doubt that many of us had any profound understanding of the consequences of this provision when it was brought in as a last minute floor amendment. In fact, the legislative explanation provided a, along with the amendment that day proved to be in many ways inaccurate and misleading. It was misleading in what it did explain and eloquent in what it failed to mention at all. The surcharge and the cancellation provisions we accepted and the modified version passed by the House will create chaos 
in American rail transportation. Incredible increases in shipping costs are inevitable. At best, parts of America can expect half the service at twice the cost. In all too many communities, shippers can look forward to no rail service at all. The existing network of joint routes and rates was designed to allow freight traffic to move from origin to destination across the lines of several connecting carriers under a single rate, a long haul rate cheaper than the sum of local rates to be transversed. In some cases, this simply eliminates the problem of you can't get there from here without separate quotes from two or more railroads. In others, it provides competition to the big railroads whose single line route to the same destination might otherwise dominate the market and force a chain of small railroads out of business. In reaching ports, it has meant that through the historical practice of equalization, export goods have access to port facilities and overseas markets at approximately equal and competitive rates. The division of traffic revenues which result from the joint rate is agreed upon by the railroads participating in the route. It is, however, subject to readjustment at the Interstate Commerce Commission if one of the rail partners can make a case that it is not getting a fair or adequate share. Although this arrangement has worked effectively for over a century, it will be radically disrupted by the surcharge and cancellation authority. Most of my colleagues are now fairly familiar with this section of the bill, and I need not describe its technicalities at length. The formula was developed by two of the nation's largest rail transportation companies, Conrail and Southern. It favors inefficient railroads with high operating costs, and as such, the surcharge becomes a reward for inefficiency, providing railroads like Conrail with a means of enhancing their revenues at the expense of prosperous carriers and all shippers. Conrail has lobbied for its passage with the threat that without surcharge authority, the price tag on its annual congressional bailout will be increasingly high.